I'm Tammy Vendange, your host for Executive with a Cause. Today on the show, I welcome Alex Reynolds, the General Manager of Membership and Digital Strategy at the Australian HR Institute. Today, we're going to chat about the good, bad, and hard things about running a not-for-profit. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tammy. Very happy to be here. Oh, it's good to see you again. We actually met in 2020 when I did my first project for, for the Australian HR Institute that some people will know as ARI. And I helped you originally to scope out a learning management system. And then we had a few projects after that. So it's really great that we have this time to talk now as you've just completed your, your digital transformation program. Yeah, it is. And um, it was a very big program. So um, we're very happy to be through that part, but there's a lot of learnings from it. <laughs> well, I know our listeners are going to be very eager to learn from that. So for, for those folks that are not um, familiar with ARI or, or the Australian HR Institute, can you please uh, just tell us more about it? So ARI is um, a membership association and we're here to um, support HR professionals through their careers, so from early journey all the way through to retirement. And as part of that, we offer um, products and services to support that, which includes training, um, certification and professionalisation of the HR um, industry within Australia, um, some major events, um, smaller networking and local events for HR professionals, um, and, and RE Assist, so we also provide resources, templates, and really practical tools to help HR professionals um, support their organisations and their employees. So the, the RE membership groups, though, are slightly different. Like, I know a lot of the professional organisations that I talk to are largely individual member-type organisations. You guys do corporate as well. How... How does that make your business model or um, maybe how does it make it a little bit more challenging um, because you're servicing both organizations and individuals? Look, it certainly does. Um, we do have our individual members um, and then we have what we call our organization members, which are essentially um, an organization can join um, with and then link their individual members to their organization. So it does create some complexity, um, both from a marketing perspective in being able to differentiate um, the difference between individual and organization and the value between um, those two membership types. And then also um, the products and services we offer, we often um, think of conferences and learning and things like that in an individual sense from a membership perspective, but Ari has the um, additional complexity of making sure that we actually also support the organisations. Um, so how we package those products and talk to our members about those kinds of things. So um, it is very easy for us to um, talk membership and think about individuals, but Ari also considers organisations and how we engage and support um, their HR teams on a, on a larger scale. Okay. And how did you get involved in ARI in the first place? Uh, so I actually came from the YMCA Victoria, um, another membership association, but very, very different in the terms of um, obviously the industry, but also how um, that organisation runs compared to ARI, which is very much um, centralised, almost a corporate type environment. Um, and I actually came across into a reception role. So I decided I wanted a change of career um, quite young in my career. And that since then I've been able to stay at ARI and to move into different positions within the organization, um, find new challenges for myself. Um, and when I first started, I actually didn't even know what hate that HR meant human resources. So I had plenty to learn along the way. Um, and since then have really, um, identified with the fact that people are very important in organisations, which is probably one of the reasons I've um, stayed at ARI because I really do believe in supporting that HR function um, because it supports the wider um, individual, wider community. 
Hmm. Well, your latest challenge has been something we worked on together, which was your digital transformation. Can you tell us more about your role in that? Yeah, so um, in 2020, um, provided a very good opportunity for Ari as a business. We had a new CEO come in um, and then COVID hit and obviously everything moved to virtual or digital. We were an organisation that um, still sent membership packs, welcome packs, brochures, certificates, all our events and all our learning um, were face-to-face or physical, if you like. So as an organisation, we really had to um, change the way we were operating. But we were also, um, with the new CEO, starting to look at um, what was actually happening to our organisation. So we were seeing a decline in membership. We were seeing a decline in um, participation um, in our products and services. So we took that opportunity to really... um, decide that as a business, if we continued the way we were continuing, um, there was a chance that in the future we wouldn't be relevant and we wouldn't actually be there as an organisation. So from then, we developed a transformation program um, and we looked at some big key areas, um, including membership, um, our digital piece, um, our learning strategy, and what underpinned a lot of that to start with was the digital piece and the fact that um, over the last 10 years, which isn't new to most organisations, we actually hadn't done a lot of investment um, in terms of upskilling our teams, but also investing in the right technology um, to really take us into the future. Um, So that's when we really um, probably connected with you and spoke about um, what did our digital roadmap look like and what kind of investment did we need to make Um, that we could then um, implement and move forward with. Well, even before I got there, though, you started working on that transformation, um, not because of your own choosing, and you weren't even anyone that had an IT background at all. So um, let's talk about that challenge of first being in charge of IT without being an IT person. Yeah, so... um, for a lot of my career at ARI, I worked in operations or in the, and particularly in the education space. Um, and one of my opportunities um, when I felt that I had reached my potential in my current role um, was that I could take a, actually take over IT. Um, up until that point, we ran on a very small budget with very little resourcing in the IT space. Um, And we decided at that point in time that it needed to be centralised. We were growing as a business in terms of headcount and we really needed to um, structure the business to structure internally to support the rest of the business. So I took over um, having no IT background. Having said that, probably systems and applications and process come more easily to me than some people, but not necessarily easily at all. Um, I think I love to be inquisitive about platforms, systems, process, and actually understand the how. Um, And I'd done that in the education space. So I had experience in learning management systems, um, in CRM, so your customer relationship management system. So I felt comfortable with that. And um, when I first started in the IT space, probably the um, difficulty for me or the bit that I found the most challenging was what I would call the hard IT, um, which is really around networking, Wi-Fi networks, um, security, all those things that require a really deep technical knowledge. Um, But I was given the support and belief that um, I could actually manage a technical team and um, work on their capability rather than actually having to be a deep technical specialist myself. And that came with other challenges, though, because um, do you want to talk about some of the reasons why you had to make changes in that space quite quickly? Yeah, so we, um, when I first started in the IT area, which was in a couple of years before we started Transformation, um, we did 
have a fairly junior team um, and some of that was based on salary restrictions or um, in the not-for-profit space, it's not always, um, we're not as competitive as with private entities, um, but also actually understanding we didn't have any documentation um, around what our systems were, what we used them for. There were different departments using different applications. So there was no security in place at all. And we'd started to make some minor tweaks that I felt comfortable with, but actually in 2020, we did have um, a major data breach um, that impacted our members. And it was at that point after we'd gone through an investigation that we decided um, it was important that we had senior technical capability um, to be able to support in making um, some harder decisions, but also be able to do the hands-on work that um, was required. Up until that point in time, we actually outsourced a lot of our IT support, um, but because our data breach actually was in relation to our CRM, which the IT provider was not responsible for, it became apparent that we really needed to take control of our own digital ecosystem, if you like, and really understand it and, and wrap our arms around it to protect our members and also to protect our staff. Well, at the time you were hosting your own CRM on premise. So um, yeah. would you have thought differently, though, had you not been hosting it yourself, that if you had a, you know, like a cloud provider, would you have considered just going ahead and outsourcing everything? I don't know. I think the circumstances helped us in our decision making. Um, but like most organisations at that point in time, you know, there was, and there still is, um, a lot of information around should you move to cloud versus should you stay on premise. But the other part of that was because we hadn't done a lot of investment in IT, our physical servers were actually at end of life. Um, so the decision became, do we actually reinvest in new servers and commit pretty much to another three to five years of on-premise servers, or do we actually now take this opportunity to start migrating to the cloud um, and bringing in someone that would actually understand what that meant and how we could set that up correctly, which is the path we ultimately took. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you talk about um, terminology that a lot of our executives would not be comfortable with. And I imagine at some point, you know, that these decisions that you had to make around, you know, going to the cloud or staying on site, these were not terms that you were even familiar with at the time. So how did you become more knowledgeable so you can start making these decisions? Because there was no one at the time in your organization that had that technical knowledge. I did very practical things. Um, I read a lot. Um, I started subscribing to a whole bunch of IT related um, websites or news sites. So um, CIO, um, Chief Information Officer, those kinds of things. I attended webinars. I Googled practical things at the start, like what is cloud? Um, cloud versus on-premise, those kind of things. And from there, I gained a base knowledge. And then I could ask more questions just based on the fact that I did have some understanding of what the differences were or um, what I really love. One thing I usually approach is when I'm doing my research is what is the problems with or what are the things that you need to think about? So then I can read about okay, well, you need to think about A, B, C, because if you don't, the consequences are this. So trying to build up my knowledge to be able to ask the right question so I'd understand what the decisions were two or three steps down the line rather than just an immediate decision. I think that's really good advice to, to actually Google those questions. Yeah. And, and the other one I like to use is what's the risk? Yeah. Yep. Right. Or, or what's the what's the benefits of choosing that solution versus that solution? It, it seems to be more exact than just putting in the word cloud provider. Well, that's right, because then you end up with um, a whole bunch of organisations that pay a lot to end up at the top of your Google search um, and also reading um, through 
um, there are, I guess the, the beauty of IT people is they do love to share information as well. So looking at blogs, but actually not just reading the article, but reading the comments below. Um, and my Twitter account changed. I suddenly started following all these um, companies, but then also the people that were responding or commenting to some of their posts so that I could kind of get a broader picture of what was happening. There's no doubt that that, that self-study was mm. quite important, but this is not actually the first time that the organization tried to invest in, in a digital tr transformation. Do you want to talk oh. about the first time? So we've, over the years, um, the way Ari has approached investing in digital infrastructure is to take an immediate problem and try and find a solution for it. So we have changed our CRM, I'm going to say 2014, 2013, um, and we only looked at that. We didn't consider what the implication or broadly what the implications for the website would be or a member portal would be. Um, so we made these decisions in isolation. Then a few years later, we actually invested a huge amount of money in a new website um, without, again, thinking back to actually, will this work with our current um, CRM? How will our member portal, which is really important um, for us so that members um, can log in, they can register for things, they can see their... Um, professional development points that, that that is really important part for our members. Um, so we made those decisions based on, predominantly on cost, but also on an immediate need without actually taking that step back and really considering um, all the requirements that we were looking for. So when we went into the digital transformation in 2020, or when we started speaking with you, we actually were able to um, acknowledge those mistakes and think about how we could actually um, go forward without making them again. And, and your program of work was slightly different than what I would recommend in other places. You also had gone through another procurement process not too long before that. And before I tell people what the first project was, because I think this was kind of unusual for what I would normally recommend, um, it might be good to talk about that first procurement process of what you had in mind. We gathered a large shopping list of every single possible process and thing that um, didn't work for us. And um, we looked specifically at a learning management system or a learning management ecosystem at the time. So we were very much focused on one of our strategies was around certification um, and um, that included um, for those that um, for a certification program with ARI a very formal education type scenario so we built all our requirements around this one program in terms of what we thought we needed um, and it really revolved around um, a learning management system but again, it didn't take into account how it was going to interact with the other systems. Um, it was going to be perfect for any um, member that wanted to go through that process, but um, it missed out on a whole bunch of other functionality and processes that would have been really important to m all of our members versus a smaller segment of our members at the time. Um, so it went through... Um, quite a lot of consultation um, internally and then externally, but specifically about the learning side of things. And then we went to market and went through a full RFP process, had vendors um, come in and present and provide huge amounts of documentation. Um, and it actually got to the point where we had um, picked a preferred vendor um, but that's when we got to the point where the business case actually didn't stack up in terms of the actual spend to what it was going to return um, to the business, um, to our members 
um, going forward. So then the brakes got put on on that particular project. Mm. And so when we first had our conversation, we, we talked about a number of projects within the digital space. And one of the big ones was still that learning management system. And, and then we had the whole digital roadmap, which included more than that. So I remember we had this long discussion about, um, so what should we do next? And for once, rather than saying, let's go ahead and map it all out, it just seemed like your organization needed to show a proof of concept that you could deliver something early and quickly to bring in more revenue. So do you want to talk about how that decision was made? So, and we did. So we did um, fast track um, the learning management system, but um, rather than going back through um, what our original requirements had been, we were able to streamline those and align them actually with um, what was going to be a return on investment for us. And um, the fact that we had moved to a virtual digital online space um, also played a significant part in that because we quickly realised our current learning management system was not set up for digital delivery. Um, it was not user-friendly, um, yet we were wanting more and more of our members to interact with us or go through our learning programs. So part of the decision on that was that it could fix an immediate need. Um, but we also looked at, um, or we did the research and Tammy, you did most of it for us, was actually making sure we picked a system that ticked off some future principles for us as well. So we weren't just putting in a system um, without thinking about what the consequences were um, for 12 months, 18 months, two years down the track, that we'd actually pick a system that would um, align with what we wanted to do in the future and have that functionality there ready for us. Mm. And, and then what, was, what were some of the other projects as part of the digital transformation? So we um, mapped out a change in our CRM, um, so how we were going to manage our membership data, essentially. Um, we also did a change to our website and our member portal. And we then also updated our finance system um, as part of that. And in, also we did our marketing system. So our e-comms platform um, all got bundled into um, that project. So it was a really big project in terms of the number of systems we were delivering and the fact that we were pretty much pulling the rug out from underneath the organisation in terms of every system that we use to um, interact with our members or to engage with our members. Um, so it was a big program of work and we actually did it with quite a lot of speed um, when I look at other organisations that take a very long time perfecting everything. And how long was that program? So I think from start to finish, once we'd actually selected a vendor, July through to March, so about nine months for implementation. Yeah. And, and how many staff members does Ari have? So we have, um, I'm going to say we have 50. We probably have about 60 by the time we include a couple of um, fixed term contracts and things like that. Okay. And, and then just from a perspective, because I think when you say a nine-month implementation could seem mm. like a long time or not, depending on the size of the organization, how many members does Ari have, both individuals and organizational? So we have about 20,000 members, um, and we may be different to some membership associations. We um, run our membership on a monthly basis. So you'll know some organisations have a renewal date for all their members um, on the 30th of June, for example, whereas we actually, the day you join is the month that you rejoin um, the following year, which also brings in some complexity for when you actually launch um, new systems, because there is no break in the year for us in particular um, with regards to our membership. So that was something we had to manage. Um, but that implementation included um, actually documenting 
um, a more detailed business requirements um, that nine months included our user acceptance testing um, and it also included our data migration and go live um, as part of that. You, you said it already that you pretty much took the rug you know, out from underneath both staff but also members as well. Um, and looking backwards now, what are some of the things that you did well? I think actually overall our speed we did well. Um, I won't say we got everything right, but we did manage to stay on track from a scheduling perspective. I think we did delay by four weeks um, in terms of implementation because we didn't feel comfortable that we'd done enough user acceptance testing um, and an extra four weeks really did um, iron out a few major kinks that could have been a really detrimental to us going forward. Um, so I think our decision making and our ability to continue to move forward was something that was really positive and that's really on the on the people side of things. Um, we did have a great vendor who worked very, very well with us. Um, so I think we were very, very fortunate in that respect. Um, and I think the other thing that was really, really important to the success, success of the project was actually the um, support from the executive group and also from our board um, that they gave us full belief that we could do it and that we could deliver it. And they also gave us the room to be able to do that, um, which was really, really important for us so that we didn't um, spend inordinate amounts of time having to do a lot of detailed project reporting. It wasn't that we weren't doing it, um, but we were. We also still had the time to be able to focus on delivering the actual project itself. And from what I remember, it, it could have changed since the time that um, I, I left the project or the program, you only hired one additional staff member for this whole thing. Correct. How we did you do hire. that? <laughs> well, that's probably one thing in hindsight we'd go back and, and change. So we hired a project manager, which was very, very important and critical to the business, to, to the actual success of the project. Um, but I do think, and, and it's not uncommon for not-for-profits to try and run business as usual and projects, whether they're digital or not, simultaneously. Um we managed it. We did some resource reallocation. Um, we picked our timing deliberately. So for ARI, we know that um, December and January and the first week or so of February is our um, quieter periods. We don't run a lot of major events. We don't have um, new programs launching or enrolments closing for learning programs, those kinds of things. And it's our quieter time for them like we have less members join in December and January um, so we did pick our launch date based on our calendar of um, our usual business activity which enabled us then to reallocate some of our resourcing um, to be dedicated 50% of the time to the project or full time to the project for for those periods um, we also made the decision that that we had an internal project team that were made up of um representatives from each department that for the most part they worked through the December and January period um, to make sure that we could stay on schedule um, and obviously then they could take their regular time off um, throughout the year and rather than the traditional um, two week everyone takes a break over the December January period. But since you had to delay the, the, the live date because of user acceptance testing. How did that impact your original schedule in terms of trying to land in the quieter months? It, um, it did have some ramifications. So we do um, run an international women. So we aimed to launch at the start of February um, because from February onwards is when a lot of our training and events um, are scheduled and start to kick off for the year, if you like. Um, so we did have a major event at the start of March and we had a couple of big programs where we had to make adjustments to what we were doing, how much marketing we could do and also um, just understanding that 
we did know overall we were going to have business interruption and actually making our budgeting and planning um, for that year um, reflect the fact that we knew we were going to have business disruption um, on our regular operations. Um, so overall, it wasn't a major impact, but it certainly did put some pressure on particular teams that did have either an event running um, or a um, membership renewals. Originally, we decided to delay sending them for a particular month and then we made the decision. So we had to scramble to send them out. So there was an impact on members not getting their um, renewal notices in time um, or not getting as many reminders as they usually would. So there were some impacts like that, um, but overall not major. If we'd had to delay another couple of months, we would have had to make a decision around, uh, do we actually launch now or do we wait until the end of the year? There's a lot of lessons learned in that in itself and the fact that you still managed to go live when you did. You talked about schedule impact. What about budget impact? How close were you to the original budget projections? So we remained on budget. We did have a contingency budget in there, which we did use. Um, but overall, we remained on budget. Now, that doesn't mean we didn't have to make, we did have to make some hard decisions around, okay, that will take us well over budget. It isn't necessary for go live. So we will push that into what we um, named our phase two implementation. And there were quite a few things that we did move over to phase two. It also gave us a chance to really consider um, what was critical to the business. Were we just running particular processes or programs because we'd done it every other year and we thought that was a good thing to do? Or could we make some quick decisions um, and either remove a process um, or rethink how we were going to do that product um, going forward? So there were some like that. And our phase two, um, we had every intention of starting a couple of months after we went live. But um, reality did hit at the go live point and for the next couple of months afterwards. Um, so it actually probably six months post go live is now when we're actually starting to revisit that list. And one of the things is we probably didn't miss any major issues as part of that that we pushed to phase two, um, which was um, good because obviously we, I feel we'd made some right decisions and it also now gives us a chance to go, well, we lived without that for six months. Is it actually that important either to us internally from a process perspective or our members haven't been asking for that? So did they not value that? Um, and we don't need to bring something like that back again. Mm. Alex, given that you've been in the organization for so long and you worked across so many different departments, do you feel like you could have implemented this particular program of work in the time frame that you did with such a, you know, just adding a project manager, had it not been the fact that you had such a broad knowledge across the organization? Probably not. Um, and it was one advantage that I did have quite detailed knowledge of um, processes, particularly related to the education team. Um, so I knew, you know, what our business rules were without having to do large consultation with um, subject matter experts. We did still obviously do that, but in lieu of someone not being available, it was much easier for me to be able to make a decision or a recommendation based on knowledge I had. We also had another senior executive that had, had worked at ARI for a very long time um, that complemented the knowledge that I had in the membership space. So was also able to bring that knowledge without us having to um, interrupt business as usual operations with our subject matter experts. So I think that really, really did help. Um, but also um, 
one thing I would go back and do is probably bring in a very experienced business analyst or business process analyst that could have actually, um, where we ran into trouble was sometimes our current business processes were not documented well. They were in our heads and we could talk to them, but actually the documentation was missing. So having some better support in that area would have actually, I think, helped deliver a better outcome for our phase one go live, but also then would have enabled us to pick up our um, phase two a little bit more quickly. It's interesting you said that because a lot of times I see organizations trying to implement the exact same process that they're currently using and it requires customization in the system. I have two questions, I guess, related. One is, how much customization did you do to the systems to try to reflect what you understood as a business process? And two, given that um, implementing a new CRM, and in this case it was Microsoft Dynamics, gave you additional functionality, did you find yourself actually redoing processes just because you knew you could do something better in the system? So, yes. Um, I think with customization, our original goal had been zero, pretty much zero customization, configuration, fine. I don't think we nailed that. And I'd say 10 to 15% of what we have is um, to a certain degree customized. And some of that comes back to what we were talking about earlier around our organization membership, um, because our individual membership is pretty straightforward. Um, but our organization membership processes are slightly more complicated and reflecting on the time frame we had, um, it would have been one product where we should have really considered pre-digital, what was the value? What did we want to get out of it? Um, because we have implemented an as-is product and process. Um, so I think there was a level of, of customization that we did go down that um, is probably slightly above my comfort level um, for the future, only because customization does mean that you um, spend later on in keeping the upkeep of um, releases, product release updates, things like that, because you've always got to check your customization side of things. Um, sorry, what was the second question? The second question is because you had additional functionality available to you through both um, Dynamics and also the members portal that you built. Did you actually change some of your processes specifically because now you had this additional functionality? We did. Um, I think we've still got a way to go in that space. So we were able to cut out um, some manual steps that our staff would do. So, um, for example, one of our steps is around when a, a professional level member joins, we, would, we used to ask them to send in their um, CV and we would check it to make sure they'd met the requirements. Um, and we were able to, through having a better online join process, actually cut out that step. So rather than um, us checking, it's a simple tick box of, um, yes, I agree that I meet those standards. And also we used to get a lot of questions come in around um, I'm not sure what membership level type I am. So now we have a tool as part of the um, member join process that enables you to put in um, your experience, your study level, um, the um, level of um, seniority that your role is, and then the system will actually recommend the membership type for you. So it takes out some of those processes. So yes, we were. I still think we've got quite a way to go in that space though. Mm. And now that the digital part of this transformation is over, what other plans do you have for the future? So I think when we originally set out transformation, um, it was and did include a business transformation. So actually looking at um, value for members, um, value of our products and what we offer, um, and, and really looking at how we grow our membership, um, how ARI evolves as an organisation, and how we support H the HR profession. So we're now picking those pieces up 
um, the digital transformation as much as we didn't want it to did cause um, huge disruption in terms of our operations and our time and effort and resourcing that needed to be spent on that and upskilling staff, um, ongoing training, um, those kinds of things. So now, and, and at, right up to the executive level. So now we are revisiting what our strategy is, um, reconfirming where we see ourselves in the future. And um, as part of our original transformation, we did a postcard from the future where we set out our um, vision statements of where we wanted Ari to go. So we've recently reconfirmed those. And now we'll actually work towards those because they're around um, certification for HR professionals, um, setting standards um, for HR professionals in Australia. Um, how do we be the career partner for HR professionals? What resources and tools do they need? But now that we're in the digital systems we want to be in, it makes it easier for us to do the design part as well. So we know we've got the platforms that will enable us to do it digitally. And part of that vision statement was that we do digital first, whereas if we hadn't done the digital transformation, we'd still be saying, oh, but our systems limit us from doing that. So we can't do that now. That, that was actually the question I was going to ask you. What would be your preference to do the business transformation first or the digital? Um, I, I know we had one element of even the website design. Um, uh, you were doing some, oh, no, it was a membership um, piece that you guys were doing a review of your memberships. And, and we kept on talking about, well, um, even your new system would do it a different way than what they were projecting it to be. And so it's always that hard um, balance of what comes first, that business change or, or, the, or the digital change to support the business change. Um, what, would you do it any different? I, I don't actually think so. One thing I think we did do well was we actually did vision the business transformation pre-digital. So we did have our, what we called our postcard from the future. So we knew where we wanted to be in five years time. Um, but it was really obvious that there was significant digital limitations. And the digital isn't just the member self-service. It was our ability to be able to access data, to be able to understand the data, to be able to collect the data. Um, so a big part for us now and, and the bit that probably I love the most about the new systems is we do have all this data, it's transparent and we can now say when we're looking at a product or a service, well, hang on a minute, let's look at what the data is telling us and we can actually see it a little bit more. Our problem is we probably need a, a data strategy to make sure we're looking at the right data. So I think overall for Ari, we did it in the right order um, and we're not, you know, we've moved very quickly in two years, in what I think is quite quickly in two years because some people, some organisations would spend two years just looking at their strategy um, and time was moving far too quickly um, with COVID and the need to um, be able to support our members in a digital sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I think you've just shared a lot of major learnings that any organization considering a, whether it's a full-on digital strategy like what you guys have done with so many different system changes or just a change of CRM or learning management system, I think there's a lot of lessons in that. Alex, um, based on all your experience, the fact that you've been live for a while now, are there any other lessons learned that you would like to share with the listeners? I think um, everyone knows this and every vendor will tell you if you are making a major change to your system, but the quality of your data um, is not to be underestimated. So we did lose about a week in cutover in having to, what we thought we'd cleaned our data, but it just wasn't good enough. Um, so we did, we were we had originally planned to turn off our systems and our website and we'd let our members know that for about four or five days, we'd be offline, but we'd be back really quickly. Um, and it turned into seven to 10 days. Now, we didn't quantify what that loss could be, 
Um, but at the time, it meant that our um, our team that was responsible for cleansing data had to work around the clock um, to clean it up and get it into a new system. So um, that was really hard during that period. Um, so I would say if you are planning on migrating data, it is not to be underestimated in terms of the time and effort and checks that it takes um, to actually clean it up to move it into a new system. Um, the other piece that I think, um, which we made a conscious decision about to a certain degree was about process, um, just about having that documented or having the resources to document very quickly um, once we turned on. So we had left some of that up to the um, teams or the subject matter experts. Some of them did a brilliant job and some just struggled because of the amount of um, business as usual activity they had to do, plus learn a new system, let alone have time to actually document what the processes were. So I think that overall we made it, but it made it quite stressful for the team and for people um, as systems turned on and all of a sudden, um, you know, all the work they would usually do in a day, they couldn't do any of it without asking for assistance. So there is a piece there that um, probably for the first six to eight weeks after go live, it was it was really challenging for our people. Mm. And, and the data migration piece, it seems to be the number one thing that comes up every time, right? Um, with with all of my clients, that, that data migration is the most painful piece out of all of it. So thank you for sharing those lessons learned. Um, Alex, I'm conscious we're, we're out of time. So um, if people want to know more about ARI, um, what, what is the best way for them to do that? So probably visiting the website, which is uh, ahri.com.au um, is a great place to start. Um, we're also on LinkedIn um, and have a quite a big following on the LinkedIn group. Um, and you'll probably find me on LinkedIn as well if you want to connect and, and have ask me any questions about transformation or about RE in general. Beware, you might get a lot of questions <laughs> on transformation, Alex. So, hey, Alex, thank you for sharing the journey that you guys have been on. I, I don't think that people recognize how crucial the information and the programs of work that you give to HR professionals as an organization, how that actually impacts everyone within, whether it's a company or a government department or a not-for-profit, that, you know, having someone there that can help um, you know, especially for a smaller not-for-profit that might only have one person that kind of manages a little bit of HR, but to have that, that hand that they can reach out to. Um, yeah, I don't think people recognize how important your organization is to so many others. But the transformation story you just shared, I'm sure is going to be something that a lot of people want to go back and review again and listen to because um, they're too probably about to start that journey or I'm thinking about starting that journey. And it's good to have all these lessons learned. So, Alex, thank you for being on the show and thank you for sharing. Oh, no, thank you for having me. Hi, this is Tammy again. When I'm not doing podcasts, I'm helping not-for-profits with IT decisions. The question for this week's IT in Plain English segment is, what is a firewall? A firewall is basically software that creates a digital barricade between your organization's network and everything else on the internet. Now, if you are an organization that uses 100% cloud-based software, which is common for small not-for-profits especially, you don't need to worry about this. That's because the vendors provide their own firewall for their solution. However, if your organization has its own servers or hosts virtual servers with a cloud provider, this episode is for you. Think of a firewall as your own private room for your organization in a massive mansion called the internet. Just like a physical private room, you'd want to create some rules about who can come in and out and what they are allowed to do when they do. Because of the importance of a firewall, if your IT team is not appropriately trained and or is not managing it well, there are all kinds of cybersecurity risk, 
One way to test your organization's vulnerabilities is to hire a cybersecurity company to perform what's called a penetration test. They'll be able to provide a report afterwards that shows how much risk your organization has and prioritizes the fixes. There you have it in plain English. If you have an IT question you want answered, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message. I just might answer it on this show. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave me a review. To all of you executives with the cause, the world is definitely a better place because of you. Thank you for what you and your teams do every day.